The Water Towns of the Yangtze River Delta by Marilyn Clemens, a San Francisco landscape architect who has lived in China and traveled extensively throughout China over the years. I've had the great luck to visit many regions of China since 1993. We had an apartment in Shanghai for 15 years as our base and visited Suzhou often. A Chinese friend, a landscape architect from Suzhou, made our visits very special. The first slide represents the feeling of the small water towns. The water, the slow movement, the shadows, the willows. This is where we're going. The map of China, you can see Shanghai on the Pacific in the center at the head of the delta and Suzhou just to the west. This is a tourist map of the area. You can see Shanghai and its relationship to Suzhou. Suzhou is on a great lake called Lake Tai, and this is where a lot of the stone for the gardens comes from. To the southwest is Nanshuen, and to the southeast is Xitan. We will visit both these places. I've also highlighted a few other water towns. Um, Tongli and Wenjun. To the south is Hanzhou, very important to the area. In Chinese, there's a famous expression, in heaven there is paradise, on earth there is our Suzhou and Hanzhou. Shanghai is the largest city in China with 27 million people on the Wangpo River. Uh, we're looking at Pudong, the modern part of Shanghai, um, and we're standing in Puxi, or the west part of Shanghai. On the right, you will see the tallest building in Shanghai, the Shanghai Tower, done by Gensler and Associates, at 2,073 feet, or 128 floors. You will take a high-speed train to Suzhou. Uh, it will take under an hour. The train stations and the um, trains are very modern state-of-the-art. You'll arrive on the second floor of the North Suzhou train station and see part of the city wall, the moat, and one of eight statues. This one happens to be Fan Zongyan of the Song Dynasty, who was a poet and a politician. And his motto inscribed is, worry about the rest of the world. If the world is happy, you will be too, something like that. Now take, let's take a minute and look at this map. It's a tourist map. You'll arrive at the train station on the north and we'll visit three gardens. We'll go around the moat inside the city wall. Think of Suzhou being established in 514 BC, about the time that the Roman Republic was starting. Old Suzhou inside the moat is just five and a half square miles. Greater Suzhou is 624 square miles. About gardens, uh, supposedly the first was built in 400 AD. A great um, amount of garden building was done in the Ming Dynasty, 271 gardens. More in the Qing, 130. Of those, 69 survive today. There are nine UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Suzhou, including temples. San Shui means landscape, and it means mountain and water, the two essential elements of a garden design. Um, it's important to say that the whole concept of landscape design is like painting to recreate the essence of nature, and it's somewhat based on a Taoist ideal of reverence for nature above worldly pursuits. These gardens were built by feudal uh, officials, wealthy merchants, those who could afford to build private residences and gardens. And in the ancient tradition, the human, human character could be partly judged by the quality of its response to nature. We're walking down one of the main streets. Notice the size of the sidewalk, the bikeway, and the travel, car travel way. Uh, we're walking along the uh, white wall of the temple compound. It, here we see the temple, the Basi Temple. Walking down a, a, a side street, um, the 1993 picture shows um, 
factory workers going to get their lunch on their bicycles, and 25 years later, same plane trees shading the street, but you see mostly tourists. The interior canals, some are very small, some have enough room to allow for back porch and bicycle storage. This, these small canals parallel the streets. Here we have the entrance to the humble, the garden of the humble administrator. Note the roof line. There is always some, sim, some tail of an animal at the eaves protecting the building. Uh, notice the, the whitewashed walls and the great tiles. This is also a UNESCO World, World Heritage Site. Inside there will be a, a large wall blocking view into the garden also. This is built in 1509. Uh, it's 10 acres and is the largest in Sujo. It has all the characteristics of these classic gardens in that the view is blocked. There are a series of framed views and the garden is seen as a retreat for tranquility, beauty, contemplation. All the structures are sort of regular in form, but the landscape is free-flowing and you're meant to experience it in movement. Here's a plan view of the garden that gives you an idea of how much water there is. In the north, there will be a lot of uh, rock formations representing mountain, and the buildings are clustered around the water. All the buildings have fanciful names, some from poems, and sometimes they're very strangely translated. I'll give you a few examples. One is Pure Will and Far-Reaching Mind. Another is Listening to the Rain Studio. I could do a whole show on this garden alone. This is one of the largest buildings. And see that it's reflected in the water. The water is very important to creating mood uh, in the reflections uh, and reflecting back light. All the windows um, and open out onto the garden and to views of the water. The name, 36 pair of Mandarin Ducks Hall, I don't know the origin. Possibly that uh, in mythology, Mandarin Ducks uh, make for life and they are a, a faithful couple. The windows in this pavilion have some blue glass in them and some people believe that's an influence of the 19th century uh, in the Qing Dynasty when European influences were being felt. Uh, most of the windows you'll see are small, uh, faceted, and, and re remember that in the beginning they were formed by paper or shade um, mother of pearl. So what you might call mullions had to be small uh, to contain the paper or the mother of pearl. These windows open out also to form a great hall. On the interior, um, you'll see that uh, all the windows frame views and also have uh, very detailed mullions. The furniture here is Ming Dynasty furniture, later, heavier, and you see a panels of stone that look like sky or mountains inset. This lovely walking gallery or corridor allows you to walk along and see both sides of the pond, both sides of the garden. And you'll notice that all windows are slightly different. And in Chinese, this is compared to a dragon frolicking in the water. This is looking down that corridor to another frame view. The reflections, again, are very important. In summer and in fall, the lotus fill the water, so there aren't so many reflections, and it makes all the buildings seem closer together. Notice that there are many places to sit, many ways to sit near the water. You can stay as long as you want. Uh, as long as the park is open. This pavilion uh, called Fan Shape was inspired by a poem and I, it mean, means that the, the owner would sit here alone perhaps at night and the poem goes, who is sitting here? The gleaming moon, the wind, and I. So a solitary visit. So it's facing east and it's a good place to watch the moon. 
another pavilion su surrounded by vegetation. You can just sit in there. Um, you can sit inside, you can sit on the edge. There are many creative screen doors or windows that open out, but also frame views of the garden. Here we have a few more pavilions, places to sit, surrounded by vegetation. See the reflections. The little boat is for the maintenance, uh, not for visitors. These are Ming era, so the earlier dynasty uh, chairs. You can see they're much more simple and elegant. There are many art shows in the garden, so this happens to be a demonstration of uh, weaving or sewing on silk. They often make transparent panels or framed pictures. Very meticulous, time-consuming work. And for the 21st century gentlemen, a local TV station has provided the equipment and small screens so that you can keep up on the news. The next garden is the smallest garden called the Master of the Nets, and it was established in the 12th century. And it's based on the idealization of a fisherman or woodcutter's solitary, solitary life, tranquil life, so that the owner called it the fisherman's retreat. Uh, he also built it to house a very valuable collection of um, Chinese history texts and as a retreat, a garden retreat for his mother. Art, artists are invited to live here. Here are some of the pavilions on the pond, a bridge, reflections. Here's the hall where the owner would have his friends uh, over for dinner, maybe for discussion, for tea, for performances, called the 10,000 volume hall. The duck hunting veranda and square pavilion are located on the pond. I cannot imagine shooting ducks in this environment, but that is its name. On the opposite side of the pond is the pavilion of breeze in the night. It's a lovely place to sit. You will notice a tree leaning on the right side of the image. This old tree is propped up to keep it living and upright as long as possible. There's a reverence for old trees. Here's the same pavilion at night with its ambient lighting. This garden is famous for its evening entertainment. And um, on the left, there's a woman holding an instrument called a pipa. In the middle, a woman playing a guizeng. And on the right, uh, women are singing and dancing. One of my favorite pavilions is this called the Bamboo Flank Pavilion, which is a tea house. You can sit inside and play chess, uh, drink tea, chat, and look out on the courtyard. The courtyards uh, are composed of um, stone, uh, many patterns, um, the shadows on the courtyard are very important. The shadows of the roof line and the plants and the rocks around represent mountains. This is a, a boudoir, a sweeping chain, on a second floor of one of the um, buildings. And you'll see um, Ming era furniture, which is very simple and elegant. This is the only sleeping chamber I have seen in the gardens I visited. This is a, a painting and writing studio. It also has framed views out the windows. And this small arch bridge seems to hold a fascination for everyone. It's over a small stream. The whole space is very um, carefully scaled of the uh, bondo grass against the white wall with the vine to diminish its size in the space. And there's a symbol uh, right before the bridge that means um, long life or good fortune. Everyone wants to cross the bridge, you might call this east meets west, and you'll notice the first step she is standing on, what we would consider a tripper or a hazard, and there are no railings. Uh, 
Uh, the third garden is the oldest, the Surging Wave P Pavilion, supposedly owned by a poet and built in 1044. Uh, you notice that most of the water is outside of the garden, and so uh, many of the rooms in the garden and the promenade look out on that pond or canal. It's very noticeable for the changes in elevation and the intricate detail of the windows and doors. So here you have a view of uh, people like hanging out along the canal. The bridge we will cross to enter the garden is ahead of us. And here's a, a view of, to the larger part of the pond and the street across uh, runs along. Inside there's an elevated walking gallery, a um, place to view the garden from both sides through these, uh, these windows, these traceries of thin terracotta bricks. Some are built with clay and wire. Another view of the elevated walkway, uh, doors and windows, no two alike. More, more windows, more frame views. You can imagine someone had a lot of fun with this. And here we have uh, two doorways with a six-foot man trying to pass through a cord-shaped door. Okay, now we've come to the IMP Design Museum in 2006. Uh, it was believed that it might be his last uh, work. We know that he, uh, he died only a few years ago. His family was originally from Suzhou, and this is his tribute to the city that he, he loved and visited often. Uh, he's, of course, taken the white walls and the gray roof line, but instead of timber roof or a clay um, bricks, uh, he has a steel roof line and uh, metal sunscreens. There, of course, is an interior pond with the carp and the lilies. In the back, you see his version of the mountains. His mountains are granite, really quite sculptural. My first visit was in the fog, one December, and it seemed to bring silence to the place, and the views were just ethereal. This frame view is a particular favorite of mine. Back to a sunnier day and uh, the pavilion on the water with the carp and the places to sit, the small bridge with no handrails. Inside the museum, there's a wonderful historic collection, many local finds. Here are two uh, golden dragons from the Tang dynasty, a, a silver mirror stand from the uh, 13th and 14th century, and one view of the corridors. You see how um, austere, in a way, how they are, how, how, how abstract from the Suzhou style. And in the cafe, there is a Suzhou style window, fragmented, beautiful. Okay, so now we're going around the moat for a leisurely ride, be five and a half miles. We got on near the Surging Wave Pavilion and sort of had to leap into the slow boat. They have cleaned up the boat a lot in recent years to provide pavilions and access to the water for the people who live there as well as tourists. And there are many, many ways to enjoy the edge of the moat. Passing under new bridges, passing new housing that it abides by the height limits of old Suzhou. And here we go under a bridge and we're going to enter the interior canals you can see the city wall and one of the city gates. As we enter the, um, the canals within the city, you'll see that uh, we're going past people's backyards, their utility areas, maybe their back garden. Some of the views are quite gritty. Some of the buildings may seem like they may fall down. Here we have two boats pass passing each other. We go under bridges that are pedestrian streets. There are some small hotels and restaurants that 
uh, back up to these canals. Ahead we see another bridge. And here's a landing and perhaps a cafe or just a place to hang out. I want to give you a quick glimpse of larger Sijo. You can see where we've been, uh, the area in the middle surrounded by the moat and development on all sides, particularly to the east. The uh, Golden Rooster Lake Park area, I, I'm going to show you one image of that. And this was their vision for the area. A high-rise office, residential, sculpture park, European-style park, even a European-style or Shanghai-style uh, city hall. And here's their waterfront. Many events take place here. They have water taxis, water sports, and you can see housing in the back and cranes, um, more buildings to come. Now we'll step back to a much quieter space. It's called Shitang, established in 770 BC. It's in another province called Zhejiang province and has about 16,000 people. Um, many Ming era buildings um, survive. Nine small rivers course through this area. We will not see them as rivers, we'll just walk along the canal. And when you arrive, you'll walk or boat. This is the feeling of the place, much more rustic. The canal is its main street. You can see that the walkways along the canal are covered. Um, this area is very hot in the summer and it also gets a lot of rain. There are uh, places to rent along here, as well as a uh, regular residence. Uh, you'll see gardens. Here's a temple. And on the top, you have two dragons playing with a pearl. And, and this uh, Chinese people recognize this right away as protection for the temple. And um, there are also two owl tails on the end of the eaves. In, in mythology, the owl tails also protect the building against fire. But basically, they're all to protect the Buddhist entity. You'll pass by courtyards with faceted windows, and here they happen to be metal. You can visit old buildings that uh, this happens to be one of the main buildings where they were having an art exhibit, and this, uh, this window detailing represents clouds. You go under or over uh, bridges that are pedestrian streets and uh, encounter widened parts of the canal where there are parks and walkways and bridges. A larger bridge that also has benches so you can just sit there and rest. You can see on the right in the background uh, probably a power boat. I think that's a security boat but all the other boats are driven by one person. This bridge also holds a stage and you can come up here by boat and watch a performance on this stage. Uh, and maybe you could rent the boat that's sitting over there to the left it's, and have a drink and uh, a private uh, place to watch the scene. Here we have another little boat going under the stage. Okay, now we're at Nanshuen, which is twice as large as Shitai. It's similar, but it's more fixed up for tourists. 120,000 people. It's another UNESCO World Heritage Site. This, si this front sign is kind of overwhelming. This monumental entrance is quite new. I guess they feel that this is what a World Heritage Site deserves. But as you enter, you'll walk around or take a boat and you'll see that it's very, very pleasant to just stroll around. People going up and down stairs with their bikes. Uh, see these buildings, you'll find this very typical of the area and even to the west towards the mountains. The, uh, the tilted roof line of gray clay and the whitewashed walls. Note the corridors. The, uh, the walkways are often covered in this town. Here, uh, grandparents are teaching their grandchild to fish. Uh, and across the way, you see laundry hanging as well as lanterns. 
two more covered walkways, people going on along with their lives. Here's another temple and an intersection of two canals, the larger one and a smaller. And to the left, modern housing. Another bridge walkway with seats and a restaurant right on the canal. You can sit there, have lunch, and watch the boats go by. Here's a almost floating garden, someone's private garden, and in the back you can see people on their back porches. A wide, wider part of the canal, that, an area that is primarily residential, a few shops, you can see laundry hanging, but and the covered corridors. And here is our boat, quietly going down the stream. Here's a widened area on off one canal, a, a veritable pond with a water spray to keep the water circulating. It was owned by a wealthy person in the Ming Dynasty. The windows, the, if you can call them mullions, are just exquisite. This is a library. And these are a, a collection of wood blocks to make, to stamp books. Very valuable old collection. One example of, of some of the beams, interior beams, uh, finally worked. Uh, there's a scene, a boat scene there. And here's a man strolling along, possibly going to Tai Chi, maybe he's going to work. Here we're back in Shanghai, and the reason I'm showing this map from 1939, that's basically a colonial map, is because Shanghainese recognize these areas as French concession, the British area, or international area, and the Japanese area to the north. Suzhou Creek, very important, used to be the transport from Suzhou of vegetables and, and construction goods down to the Vampo River. Our apartment was right north of Suzhou Creek. And you see the Chinese city, which is of course not called that. It's called the Old Town, and that's where we're going next. Here we are in Old Town, which is usually full of people, the Old Town God's Temple Market full of shops, restaurants, tea houses, and people. And there you will cross the nine bend or nine turn bridge to the garden. Here's another view of the, the area and the, and the bridge. We're in a dumpling restaurant looking down on the lines of people waiting for entrance to the Yuden Garden. You can see the white wall and the clay tiles. Here's a view of the garden, which is not very big. It's five acres, established in 1559, called the Urban Mountain Forest. And an official bought the land, uh, built it for his family. Um, there is a great mound of stone to the north of the garden. Apparently 2,000 tons of stone were built in, brought in to build that mountain. Five dragon walls and, by their count, 48 scenic views. Here's one of the dragon walls. Inside there are a lot of intimate spaces uh, that have framed views. You find yourself going, twisting and turning, going around. There's no set itinerary. Many small uh, red painted buildings. This is the Three Corn Ear Hall. I don't know the origin of the word, but we assume it's associated with agriculture. And here are several pavilions on the pond, a terrace to view the fish, and one mountain. A corridor crossing the uh, pond, so you can look at it in, in two ways, and a large pavilion beyond. You can also cross the pond on these rocks. You, you may have to wait for someone feeding the fish, but there are many ways to go around the garden. The building has, uh, at the end of the corridor, has often has art exhibits, but it also allows you, it gives you vistas over the whole garden and even to the city from up the upper floor. Notice the roof line. 
on the roof of the crane represents long life and uh, the phoenix or dragon represents uh, strength of course these protect the building and you also see a man on horseback this also represents the mountain, this great mound of stone, and on top of it is a pavilion called the Tower of Joy. And these uplifted eaves represent joy. We're standing here on a pavilion called uh, for viewing frolicking fish, and you see the water goes under one of the walkways. This um, this pavilion once. Uh, was where the Small Sword Society met to plan an uprising against the imperialists in the 19th century. It didn't work that time. A, a lovely view of the Tower of Vitality, also on a pond. Willows everywhere, rock everywhere. A floating pavilion, one of the prettiest. And more upturned uh, roof lines. Um, I'm sure all these animals once meant a lot, but now I think they're just pure joy. The elephant in Feng Shui means strength, protection, wisdom, and good luck. More intimate spaces, places to sit and rest, uh, detailed windows, shadows of plants. And finally, another window where you have a clay sculpted crane, plants, and a real wisteria coming through from one side of the garden to the other. And here we are back to Shanghai at night, looking at Pudong with all its buildings lit up, except the Gensler Tower doesn't have its top lit for some reason. There's only uh, a very faint light at the top. Thank you very much. That ends our trip to the water towns of the Yangtze River Delta.